Um, thanks. It's great to see so many people back here. Uh, today we're going to start to talk about the proof of the decoupling theorem. And I thought, so I'll start by giving a reference. The best place to read about the proof of the decoupling theorem is um, this essay by Ciprian and Sean, a study guide for the L2 decoupling theorem. Um, and I, they, I think they do a very good job. They, they present everything in a very clean way. What I'm going to try to do in these lectures, I, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to try to do something sort of complementary. Um, so, I, so in the last year, I became a father. And I spent a lot of time um, at home taking care of Elon. And so I would have 10 minutes to think about math here and 10 minutes to think about math there, and no time to write anything down. And I was trying to think about decoupling and understand it better. Um, and I, my fantasy was to be able to understand decoupling in a way where I could go through the proof without sitting down and writing down long equations, or where I could explain the proof to somebody without writing long equations on the blackboard. That's still a fantasy that I'm pursuing. Uh, but I, anyway, by trying to think that way and work that way, I understand it better than I did a year ago. And, and that. so I'm going to try to um, uh, explain that, the perspective that I have so far. Uh, OK, let me remind everybody what the result is that we're talking about. So suppose we have a domain which is decomposed into smaller domains. Um, and then if uh, um, so the decoupling constant of this decomposition, this is the best constant so that for any function f with Fourier support in this big domain, We have the following inequality relating um, the original function with the pieces that come from decomposing the domain. So FLP is bounded by decoupling constant times sum over theta, F theta LP squared to the one. OK, and there are many examples of domains cut up in different ways, but the one we're going to focus on is the sort of simplest interesting one that Bourdain and Demeter studied, which is the parabola. So we take a, a unit parabola and we cover it with rectangles theta. So the number of rectangles theta is A. And each theta is essentially a 1 over a squared by 1 over a rectangle. OK. And then the theorem is that for the range of p in between 2 and 6, the decoupling constant for this scenario, which I'll denote as d sub p of a, is quite small. It's smaller than an a to the x. So at the end of last time, we were starting to talk about how the um, key ingredient in the proof is to look at the problem at many different scales. And in fact, the, the whole way, the, the whole statement of the decoupling inequality, the exact form of the statement, is kind of especially designed to be able to look at the problem at many different scales. Um, so, so I want to explain that now to flesh it out more fully. Um, OK, so let's start, let's start to prove some lemmas. The first lemma says that this decoupling problem um, is invariant under affine changes of coordinates, like in uh, Mike's talk. So if, if I have a map from Rn to itself, which is an affine uh, linear, or more generally affine, change of variables, then the decoupling constant in the new coordinates, so the decoupling constant for taking L omega and decomposing it into L theta, is exactly the same as the decoupling constant for taking omega and decomposing it into theta. And proof of this is just a change of variables. Um, so suppose I have a function g whose Fourier support is in here. I'll call it g sub L omega, and it's the sum of g L thetas. And if I just perform a linear change of variables, let me imagine first that L is linear. If I just perform a linear change of variables by the adjoint of L, 
then I get a new function f whose worry support is an omega, and um, it's the sum of f datums. Okay, and then the LP norm of G is just the Jacobian of this linear map to the one over P times the LP norm of F. And the same is true for the thetas. The LP norm of G theta is just the Jacobian to the one over P times the LP norm of F theta. So the relationship between these is exactly the same as the relationship between those, and we have the same decoupling constant. Okay. And translation is even easier. Translation just means we relate these functions by multiplying by a phase. And so, um, so all the LP norms are the same. Okay, so why is that important? That comes up in, in kind of sub-problems of our original problem. So suppose inside of our parabola, we want to take not all of the rectangles theta, but just some, some collection of them over an arc of the parabola. So let's call this whole thing tau. So maybe along the way, as a stepping stone to understanding my whole problem, I would just like to understand um, what happens when we combine f thetas in this smaller region tau. So I have uh, tau is the mean of theta. Um, and as an application of lemma one, the decoupling constant of this is exactly, uh, th this scenario after a linear change of variables is the same as our original problem. So, so let me say that the number of theta in tau is a1 less than a. And this decoupling constant is exactly the same as the decoupling constant of a1. Because I can make a linear change of variables that takes this arc of the parabola and maps it to the whole parabola. And then this subproblem uh, is equivalent to the original problem where my whole parabola has been cut into a1 pieces. And that has this decoupling constant. Okay, so now um, I can look at my, my parabola at two different scales. I can take the whole parabola and cut it into a bunch of taus at some scale, and each tau is cut into a bunch of smaller pieces, and um, those, those two scales fit together really nicely, and that leads to the following lemma. Lemma two. Um, if I write A as a product, A1 times A2, then the decoupling constant of A is bounded by the decoupling constant of A1 times the decoupling constant of A2. And there, there, there might be a bit of a... So we, things aren't maybe exactly perfect somewhere. We might lose a constant back. Okay, so why is that? Well, so we, we take, um, we cut our whole domain omega into a bunch of taus, and the number of taus is A2. And each tau looks like in this example over here. And so just by the definition of the decoupling constant, I can now say that FLP squared is bounded by decoupling constant of A2 squared times the sum on tau of F tau LP squared. Just by the definition of this thing. But now, for each tau, I'd like to now cut it into smaller pieces, theta. And this, in this uh, equation here tells me what happens. Um, this is equivalent to saying that f tau LP squared is bounded by decoupling constant of A1 squared times the sum over the thetas in tau of F theta LP squared. So we just plug this thing in here for each of these taus, and we see that this is less than dp of a1 squared times dp of a2 squared times the sum over all of the thetas of f theta lp squared. Uh, and that's it. We compared the f lps to the f theta lps. You can always do it with this constant, and that's that's lemma two. Okay. Cool. So this is really simple, but it's also really important. Um, in, the, in the last lecture, 
Someone in the audience asked about another, another inequality you might be interested in relating the f's and the f thetas, which is called a square function estimate, which is older and may have seemed more natural because it has this really clean connection to probability. Um, but if you, if you take a square function estimate and you try to do this trick with the two layers, you don't get this really clean thing. You get a complete mess. Um, and so a really important thing about writing this exact inequality is that when you do it in steps, you break omega into taus into thetas, everything fits together as cleanly as you could hope for. Um, that structure means that we can profitably, we can in a well-organized way, look at a lot of different scales. And that's the main thing we're going to make use of. OK. So to sort of illustrate how useful this is, I'm going to give a very short proof of our main theorem, which, but which is also wrong. Um, let's call it a joke proof. joke proof that dp of a is smaller than a to the epsilon. OK, so here's the, here, here we go. This is the joke proof. The proof is by induction on a. <coughs> OK, um, so I want to understand dp of a. So first I apply lemma 2, and I say that this is bounded by dp of a to the 1 half times dp of a to the 1 half. Now by induction, I imagine that I already understand dp of a to the 1 half, and it should obey this inequality. So this is smaller than a to the epsilon over 2 times a to the epsilon over 2. And I multiply that out, and we get a to the epsilon. So I don't know what symbol to put at the end of a joke proof. Triangle with a winky. OK, uh, Okay. so this proof is clearly wrong for the following reason. The theorem that we're trying to prove holds when p goes between 2 and 6. And we saw last time that it's false for every p which is bigger than 6. And if you look at this proof, uh, it has nothing to do with the value of p. So it must be wrong. Uh, um, so what is wrong with it? What's that? It is a constant, yeah. So what's, so list um, be in red. We will put some corrections. So what are the problems? Um, so we pointed out that there should be this less than tilde, that in this argument, it wasn't completely clean. So there's really a constant here. Maybe it's 10. And therefore, uh, there should be a 10 here. And there should be a 10 here, and there should be a 10 here, and the induction doesn't close. Good. OK. Um, any other problems? Uh, OK, great. So there's a question. Um, what is the base case? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so the question was, is, is the base case a equals 1? So if a is equal to 1, then we've only broken our function into one piece, so this is a sum over one thing. So when a equals 1, it's true that uh, dp of 1 is 1. Right. But um, that can't be the base case because uh, that's sort of not helpful here, no matter how many times we multiply 1 by itself. We won't get anywhere. So the base case um, cannot be 1. Um, and I, actually, th I think that that's the main problem, the, the base case. Maybe we should think for a second, what is dp of 2? So B dp of 2 is some number. It's not hard to see that it's less than 2. It's more than 1. Maybe it was 1.5. I don't know. Um, but that's not good enough, because 1.5 is only 2 to the, I don't know two to the one half or so. And, and that means we could only have epsilon equals one half if that was our base case. Um, cool. OK, great. So we identified two problems. And actually, the central problem, in my opinion, is the base case. So if you gave me a, a really good base case, um, 
then even though there's a 10 here, if you follow what happens in the iteration, uh, it's pretty good. The central problem is that there's no base case. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's kind of interesting, actually. Let, let me make a couple of remarks about this. Um, so the first remark is that, yeah, I mean, usually in math, the base case is easy and the induction is hard. But in this problem, actually, the induction is easy and the base case is really hard. Um, that's kind of unusual. And it, it, it means that this really hard, for any particular epsilon, suppose I'd like to prove this theorem where epsilon is 1 over 1,000. I just need to produce a base case. Um, and the base case is a finite computation. So, so remark one, um, you know, so it, uh, according to the theorem, it's in fact true that d6 of 10 to the 10,000 um, is smaller than uh, 10 to the 500, which is 10 to the 10,000 to the 120. And then if we just iterate with lemma, lemma two, we iterate, that's good enough to see um, that d6 of a is smaller than a to the 110 a for every a, for every a. So because there is that constant up there, one has to be a little bit more careful than what I wrote here, but it's not a big deal. And that just accounts for a bit of a loss between 120th and the 110. And on the other hand, this thing, uh, this is not completely obvious, but it's not, not too hard to reduce this to a finite computation. It's not a feasible computation, but it's a finite computation in the sense of computation anyway. Um, cool. So actually, I think that that is fairly unusual in math, that a, a famous interesting theorem can be reduced like that to a finite computation except one that's too long to actually do. Uh, okay. This is not how uh, Ciprian and John proved the theorem. Uh, but this lemma is still super relevant. Let me make another remark about why this is important. Um, suppose we were somehow able to do a bit better than this. So suppose that we had um, dp of a is smaller than dp of a to the 1 half times dp of a to the 0.499. We just were able to make a little improvement. Um, then this would have worked. Then this would have worked because here the total power of epsilon would be like 0.999 epsilon, and I'd have a factor of 10. And that would be good enough to close the induction. So, so that would imply the goal. Right. And there are lots of variations of this, but let me just write down one that is kind of actually relevant to proving this theorem. Um, so suppose I could prove something like, dp of a smaller than dp of a to the half times dp of a to the quarter um, times, then there's a term where I have a nice bound, a to the epsilon over 8, and then maybe dp of a to the 1 eighth. Yeah. So, that, so I'm imagining a sort of weighting 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth, 1 eighth, which adds up to 1. And for most of these things, I just have the decoupling constant. But for one of the things in this list, I somehow got a good estimate. This would again be good enough. This would be good enough to prove what we want. Um, sorry, can you say it again? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. The, let me just read it. I'll just read it again. 
This is dp of a to the 1 half, dp of a to the 1 quarter, a to the epsilon over 8, dp of a to the 1 eighth. Uh, so, so these are some of the some numbers that will actually kind of appear in the proof. But th so there, you could put lots of things over here, and if you if you have a bunch of dps of powers of a on the right hand side that add up to exactly one, that's not good enough to close the induction. But if it, they add up to 0.999, no matter how they're organized, that is good enough to close the induction, and it's okay to also have something like this. Yeah. So the, so the way I want it, like to think about it is that this. This didn't prove anything, but I just need like a little bit of extra leverage. You know, it's, it's like one of those mountain climbers who you're kind of stuck, but if you just had the tiny finger hole for your pinky somewhere, if you could just get a little something, then everything would work and we would get this very strong estimate. Okay. So we have to do the work of actually, of, of actually getting a little improvement somewhere. Um, and okay, and, and um, uh, so we're gonna, get at something like this by looking at many different scales. So now, let me, let me explain that. Okay. I want to look at many scales. So I'll draw a big parabola here. And it's cut into pieces. And to, in order to draw good pictures with a lot of scales, I'm going to make the smallest, I'm going to make the original thetas way smaller than I drew them before. So this is the scale of theta. So one, one of these is theta. And, and you can just think of it as an arc, because I, I made it too small to draw a rectangle. OK. Um, so that's, that's theta. And I'm going to think of that as the zeroth scale. So I'm going to put theta upper 0. And then I'm going to group some of them together. So I'll produce a group that's called theta upper 1 at that scale. And there are a bunch of theta upper 1s. And then we're going to take a bunch of those and put them together. So I'll put it over here. And so th this chunk over here will be called the theta upper 2. And so on. And there'll be a whole bunch of different scales. Okay. So let's say that the number of theta upper j's is called a sub j. And so our original a is a sub 0, um, which is way bigger than a sub 1 and so on, which goes down to some last scale, a sub s, which is 1. So at the very end, we just have one, uh, one arc, the whole parabola. OK. Um, So at scale j, we might like to pay attention to the following thing that I'll call e sub j of f, which is just the sum over all of the theta j's of um, f theta j lp squared to the 1 half. Um, so e sub, e sub s of f, there's just at the last scale, there's just one f, which is our function f. So e sub s of f is just a fancy way of saying the LP norm of f. And e sub 0 of f um, is just taking the original thetas and taking the sum of the squares to the 1 half of the LP norms of the f theta. So what we want to show is that uh, e sub s of f is not too much bigger than e sub 0 of f. Now you might think that uh, the way to show this would be to check that e sub s is smaller than e sub s minus 1, which is smaller than e sub s minus 2, all the way to e sub 0. Yeah. Can you, can you draw the other rectangle? e sub 0 is the big chunk. e sub s is the little chunk. Is that how it looks to you on the table? So this is, uh, maybe, let's check it. So e sub s of f, s is, has just one term here. So this is just FLP. And this one is the original thetas. Yeah. Yeah. 
I also got constantly confused about what, what's big and what's small. Anyway, okay. So you might think that the thing to do would be to show that e sub s is smaller than e sub s minus one, which is smaller than e sub s minus two, and so on. And indeed, if we knew all of those inequalities, uh, we would be done. But because of this induction on scale structure, we don't actually need that much. Um, so let's erase the joke proof and put something more like the real proof. So because of these multi-scale considerations that we were just doing, uh, we know that E sub J plus one of F, we know that that's smaller than the decoupling constant for A sub J over A sub J plus one. This is, this is just, if I wanna know, you know, how many uh, theta j's are contained in a bigger theta j plus one. That's a sub j over a sub j plus one. And so if I'm, if I, yeah, so e sub j plus one of f is bounded by that decoupling constant times e sub j of f. And suppose that for every f, there existed just one j, so that I had a better bound. e sub j plus one of f is bounded by a j over a j plus one to the epsilon times e sub j of f. So if I had this for all the j's, I just multiply everything out and I get what I want to show, no problem. But suppose I just knew that for every f there was one j where this happens, and for all the other ones this happens by definition. Then when I multiply everything out, I get this type of inequality, and it's still good enough. Um, so this, so this, let's call this double star. This, this double star also implies that dp of a is bounded by a to the epsilon. Yeah. So let me summarize, and then we'll pause for questions. So uh, what I wanted to explain is that the inequality we're studying is set up to behave very nicely when I look at it at different scales. And because of that, I can do induction on scales. And um, what I win by doing induction on scales is that for each function f, I just need to prove that there's one scale where a good estimate occurs, and I can handle all the scales below, before and afterwards by induction and get the desired estimate. Yeah. What happens if, if f gets very large frequency? Suppose it's worse than one f, but the f is in this case very large. Um, yeah. What are the AJs? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I can tell you what the AJs are. Um, so the first one is big A, which is some big number that's given to us. And then the pattern is that A1 is the square root of A, and A2 is the square root of A1. So it's A to the quarter, and so on. So that's what these are like. Um, and yeah. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Does that is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. I guess we you could be worried that we don't want to use this in a situation where this quotient is quite small because there was also a constant here, and this quotient had better be a lot larger than this constant for this to be legitimate. So, yeah. So, um, but, okay, so that's technical, and when we, we'll, we'll see that that's okay when we do the real details next time. Okay, cool. Um, so that's kind of interesting, um, and I was able to understand it without writing a lot of equations on paper, but it doesn't sound that convincing yet, and it raises an important question, uh, like, why is there a good scale? What makes a scale good? And how do you know that there is such a good scale? And so the second half of, of today's talk, I want to try to explain that, what makes a scale good. Okay. 
Um, so now, uh, the next thing I'd like to do is to try to visualize these F beta j's. Um, and so, so to visualize, we visualize them in terms of wave packet decompositions. So each F beta j has a wave packet decomposition. And what that, what that means more precisely is that, although it's not, it's, this is not 100% true, so I'll call it a white lie, but at least morally, the norm of each function f theta j is approximately constant on translates of theta j star. Yeah, okay, this is kind of terrible notation. Two superscripts. Um, so remember what from last lecture what theta j star meant. Here's theta j. Theta j star is the dual rectangle. Um, and the so the dimensions of this dual rectangle are that the long one is a j squared and the short one is a j. And there those are exactly the reciprocals of the dimensions of the small rectangle. Um, so I had planned to derive, I, I thought to maybe derive for you why this is true, um, but I also want to manage the time, and it's, I don't know if you, if you it's not that difficult. Um, how many people would like to see it? Okay, it's enough. So I'm going to give you a brief sketch of how to prove something like this. OK. So sketch of this locally constant thing. Maybe I should mention this. So this is the structure that we saw in the examples that we did last time, that they were all built out of these wave packets. And I, at the time, mentioned that actually all examples are like that, and I would say something about it later. So this is when I say something about it. All right, so it's easiest to understand the following. Suppose that I have a function g, and the support of the Fourier transform of g is contained in the unit ball. It's a bit easier to imagine than these funny shapes theta, but then it's not that different. Uh, okay, um, so then just to figure out how to exploit this, I take a function eta, which is identically one on the unit ball, and then I observe that um, g hat is g hat times eta. If I take the Fourier transform of that, I get that g is g convolved with eta check. Now if eta check is a nice smooth bump, then I can say that eta check of x, um, it's around one on the unit ball and then it decays rapidly. So for example, I could say it's smaller than one plus the norm of x to negative 10n. Um, okay, so that tells me, this is gonna tell me something about g. I plug in this equation and I study the norm of g of x because I want to understand something about the norm of f of theta j. Um, uh, it tells me that the norm of g of x is smaller than the integral of the norm of g of y times the norm of eta check of x minus y. And then that's smaller than the norm of g of x times 1 plus x minus y to the negative 10n. G of y, thanks. Cool. So this thing that I'm integrating against is centered at the point y equals x and on, has radius one and then after that it decays quite rapidly. And this tail is, um, it is really there and it presents a lot of minor annoyances in the Fourier analysis proofs. But as a first approximation, we all like to pretend that there was no tail. Uh, so that would lead to the following white lie. Uh, 
right lie is that the size of g of x is bounded by the average of g over um, the ball around x of radius 1. And this is what we would get if we were allowed to forget about the tail of this rapidly decaying function. OK. Um, so this is telling us that the biggest value of g on a ball is um, comparable to the average value of g on a ball. And that's a bit stronger than, so here's a slightly less white, white lie, but it's, it's fine for our purposes to be that the size of g is basically constant on each unit of x. Okay, so, so g can vanish, so you sh should take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But the, you know, the part where g, maybe this is the zero set of g over here, and, but in, in almost all of the ball, the norm of g is almost constant. And that's the picture that's helpful. Okay. And then, so this is basically the same problem, except I simplified my life by taking a unit ball instead of theta, which is a rectangle. Um, and you can go back and forth between those just by changing variables. And the computation is best done not on the blackboard. Okay. Um, okay. So that explains something about the geometric structure of each of the f theta j's, which we'll be exploiting in the fullness of time. And so now I'm ready to try to make a picture of what's going on when we go from scale theta j to scale theta, to, from the j to the j plus one. Um, so for the sake of my picture, let's imagine that j is one. So these are, the, these are all theta j's, and that's a theta j plus one. Okay. And I'm going to make a full color picture of how of, of the f theta j's and the f theta j plus ones, and we'll try to understand what happens when we increase from j to j plus one. Um, okay. So let's make uh, this this one orange, um, and so I'll draw over here some orange wave packets that represent that f theta j. So maybe that function consists of two wave packets that I'll draw like this. So, so up here I'll, I'll label portrait of the F theta J. Okay. And then, um, then I'll take another theta j, which is in the same bigger cap. So when we're going to be adding these two together when we go from j to j plus one. And um, I like to think of it as a similar color because it's a similar frequency. So this is a solid orange. And this one I'm going to draw in dotted orange because then at the end, at, at scale j plus one, this fellow is going to be orange. So there's some dotted orange wave packets, maybe like this. And then um, maybe over here, there are some com completely different um, theta j's that we're going to end up in a different theta j plus one. And so I'll make them a different color. I'll do uh, purple. And there's a purple guy over here. So let's say there are a purple wave packet. Um, OK, and I think it's enough for now. So. Um, so for each theta j, I have, I have these wave packets. And let me put some length scales into this picture. So this length scale here is the length of a, of a wave packet theta j, which we recorded here. It's a sub j squared. And this length scale here is the width of a wave packet. So that's a sub j. OK, and now we want to understand what happens when we go from j to j plus 1 which means that we're going to add together all of the different functions within this larger uh, function. So for instance, uh, 
we add together this orange wave packet with this dotted orange wave packet, and they'll interfere in some way over here. And the resulting function is going to be made out of wave packets, but at a smaller scale, uh, corresponding to j plus 1. So um, so it's natural to look at this thing inside of a ball here. I'm going to draw this ball over here. The scale of this ball is a j plus 1 squared, which is the same as a j. And this is the reason that Cyprian and, and John and many people before them chose this sequence of scales like this. Yeah. OK. Um, so inside of, inside of this ball here, uh, the, different orange, the different orange f theta j's will all add up somehow and produce uh, a new orange f theta j plus 1. And I didn't draw any purple guys through there yet, but so let's draw a purple guy through there. Um, so there'll be some purples. And this is happening on each of the different balls of the, of the side length um, aj. So I'll do, I'll do one other here. So that's over there. And through this ball, we see a couple of different orange things. So they're going to interfere in some complicated way. Um, who knows what will happen? Maybe we see this. And I just see one purple thing. So if there's really just one purple thing, then um, nothing can happen. We didn't add anything to anything. So we know that it's still evenly distributed. So that would look like this. Um, but if there were more purple wave packets passing through here, something more complicated could happen. OK. OK. Um, so. So to keep track of, to understand how, how things change, how the E sub j's, for example, change when we go from the jth level to the j plus first level, we have to understand what happens when you add up the different orange wave packets inside of this ball. And there's, so there's a, uh, um, so the next thing that we can bring into play is orthogonality. different wave packets, f theta j. Um, let me give a name to these red balls. Let me call these uh, boxes sub j plus 1. So boxes whose length scale is the length of a wave packet in the j plus 1 stage. So these functions, they are morally orthogonal. on each box of this scale. So, th so these functions, of course, are orthogonal on the whole space because their Fourier supports are disjoint. But even after we restrict them to something of this scale, they're still morally orthogonal to each other. And the way to think about the scales is that um, this length scale is aj, and um, this length scale is aj inverse, so the, the separation between them is uh, inversely proportional to this length scale, which is a big enough separation that they should be orthogonal already on that ball. OK. So that tells us something about how the orange output on this red ball is related to the orange input on this red ball. Namely, that if I want to study f theta j plus 1, L2, on the red box, that's about the same as the sum f theta j L2 of the box squared. squared. OK. OK. So now we have an enough description of the situation that I can describe a maybe a little bit naive way to track what's happening as we go from, from um, E0 to E1 to E2 and so on. So what we're going to do 
is that for at each stage, we draw all of these rectangles and we, and we know their heights. And then on each red ball, when I have to combine um, the different orange functions on this red ball to get the orange output, I use this piece of information. It gives me some control. And that tells me something about how, how the J relates to the J point. Okay, now you might be suspicious that this is not good enough to work. One thing that you might be suspicious about is that we really want to understand LP norms and we're using this orthogonality which is very tuned to L2 norms and um, how great a job could it really do? Could it really do a perfect job of describing what's happening at, at LP norms? And, um, and you would be right to have that suspicion. This is not going to by itself work. Um, so let me show you a hypothetical bad example. I can't show you a real bad example because the theorem is true. I'm gonna show you a hypothetical bad example, which this, as far as this strategy is concerned, it could happen and, and then it would screw us. It would, it would make things not work. Okay, so here is my hypothetical bad example. So in my hypothetical bad example, the input has uh, many parallel wave packets for each theta. So here's a, a version of that picture on the left. There are wall-to-wall -wall parallel wave packets for each theta. And that's true for, you know, in all the directions, but I'll just draw two directions. Maybe I should have made those orange, but I was not on my game and then there's wall-to-wall -wall parallel wave packets theta. Going out. Okay, so that's what we input. And then um, we're going to cut this up into squares at this appropriate smaller size. And on each square, we're going to use orthogonality. Um, and so this is the J world. And over in the J plus one world, we first of all cut this into squares at the smaller size. Okay, and then in each square, um, when I add up all of the white wave packets, it's going to compress, the, the, the sum is going to be compressed into a single wave packet in each of the squares. And that's true for every color. So this is, this is my example that I'm gonna argue would be bad for us. And this picture really describes the situation because the L2 norms are the same. So if I want to compare the height of this wave packet to the height of one of these wave packets, this equation tells me how they should be related. So I've really described the functions. Okay. Um, so let me tell you why this is bad. Yeah, so, so each function f theta j is evenly distributed over this whole um, big square, but each function f theta j plus one is pretty concentrated into a small subset of the square. On the other hand, by orthogonality, if we look at L2 norms, the sum of the squares of the L2 norms of everybody here is equal to the sum of the squares of the L2 norms of everybody there. So on the L2 level, everything agrees, but this one is more spread out and this one is more concentrated. And if you compare LP to L2, um, L, LP is more sensitive to concentrated things than L2. So if we switch, so in L2, these were an even match, but in LP, this is going to be a lot bigger than that because it's more concentrated. Okay. Um, cool. So this is, 
So this can't really happen. And one way, what, what turns out to be the case is that you know, if we just pick one of these squares, it could well happen that all of the purple wave packets going through this square could add up to be a concentrated single purple wave packet. That could well happen for one square. But it turns out it can't happen at all of the different squares. It's very overdetermined to get that to happen at so many places. Um, but it's hard to prove that, so we're not going to try to prove that directly. Instead, we're going to classify this as a bad scale. If this happens, say, from 0 to 1, then 0 to 1 is not the scale we want to be looking at, and we would take each one of these and look at it more closely and hope that something that we have better luck at a, at a further down scale. So now I want to say a little bit more quantitatively what makes a scale good or bad and why there's a good scale. Um, so let's say that in each, in each box j, each f theta j uh, consists of around wj wave packets. So in, in my example, wj is aj, which is as big as it could possibly be, enough wave packets to completely fill box j. And in my example, wj plus 1 was 1, which is the most concentrated it could possibly be. OK. And, and the, what made this example problematic is that this was really big and this was really small. We'd like to avoid that. Um, so okay, so we notice that WJ has to be somewhere between 1, where there's just one wave packet, and AJ, where there's wave packets solidly fill the box. And so a, a helpful way to think of it is to say that WJ is AJ raised to the power of omega J which is just a nice normalization because it means that omega j is somewhere between 0 and 1. And now I can tell you what is a good scale. j is an epsilon good scale if omega j plus 1 um, is at least omega j minus epsilon. And with this definition, it's very easy to check that there is a good scale. Let me call it a lemma. Um, there exists some j, which is somewhere between 0 and 1 over epsilon, uh, which is epsilon good. Uh, OK, so the proof is that if the scale is 0, if some scale is not epsilon good, then wj plus 1 has to go down by an epsilon. And it cannot keep going down by epsilon forever because it's stuck between 0 and 1. So it's some, somewhere in here, there's an epsilon good scale. Cool. OK. So in this example, this is really not, this is the opposite of being a good scale. Uh, in this situation, omega j is 1, and omega j plus 1 is 0. But somewhere, if we look down through many scales, we'll come to a good scale, a scale where omega j and omega j, omega j plus 1 is bigger than omega j almost. Or it could be smaller, but just by a little bit, not by a lot. Okay. Um, cool. So to end, let me just, let's just do the thought of experiment of modifying this bad example, um, modifying it by making omega j and omega j plus 1 the same, and seeing how it improves compared to what, what we compared to the bad example. Yeah. So um, what would it look like? What would it look like in this picture if I changed omega j plus 1 to be 1 to match omega j? Because it's not in a good scale, it's not allowed to be any smaller than 1. What that would mean is that instead of having one purple wave packet in each small box, I would have completely filled each small box with purple wave packets. And then the purple functions on this side would be completely evenly spread out, just like the purple functions on that side. And then um, the uh, LPs and L2s would, would behave exactly the same as each other. And, um, anyway, and, and then it's not hard to check that this transition uh, 
uh, behaves well with respect to the, to the EJs that we want to keep score. Okay. Um, great. So here's a summary of the proof that we'll carry out next time. By the thing we said at the beginning, we're allowed to look at a lot of different scales, and we just have to locate one scale where we can prove a good estimate. And this is the scale that, the type of scale that we look at, a scale where this is true. And then at this scale, we do just the, just the naive thing that I was describing before. We look, at the, we look at the wave packets at scale j, and in each small box where they intersect, we use orthogonality. And um, then we'll compute next time to check what happens and to see that in that situation, our inequality is true. And there might be another wrinkle of or so. It wasn't in this summary. But, but that's the plan. OK. So, so thank you. Yeah, so are you saying, in, so in my model example, this cube looked just like that cube, but they don't have to. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So the different cubes could look different from each other. Um, but that's not that serious a problem. You just divide them into classes according to a roughly how big Wj is. And there are not too many, there are like logarithmically many classes which we'll lose. And, um, and then we can look at a situation that's uniform. Other questions? Yeah. Maybe this question for the people that are in the In your argument where you use the inequality to be precise with respect to the Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we, so we don't use the lemma. So we have, we have something like this. We have something like this. dp of a is bounded by, let me write something less complicated than before. I think I overcomplicated it. Um, it's bounded by dp of a to the 1 half times dp of a to the 1 quarter. Suppose we had this. So now I'm, I'm not allowed to say that this is dp of a to the 3 quarters. I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to prove by induction that dp of a is bounded by a to the epsilon. So by, by inductive hypothesis, I get a to the epsilon over 2 here and a to the epsilon over 4 here. Um, and uh, I lose some constant. And, but because that's only a to the 3 quarters epsilon, as long as a is big, the, uh, that closes the induction. Uh, so, so if I if I have this, um, I mean, you're saying it's not okay. So that so then yeah. So then if you write out what happened with that chain, there are a bunch of things like this where these total exponents add up to less than one, and then there's a, a good term with the epsilon. It's, so it's the same as this with more complicated numbers. 